Good evening everyone, this is the Planning Committee dated the 5th of December. I'd like to first go to item number one, uh, which is for apologies. So at the minute I've got apologies from Councillor Jason Jones, is there any other apologies? No? Okay, also just to note that, um, to thank Tina Clement, Councillor Tina Clements for her time as Chair on the Committee. So. Agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting. So I'd look to ask the committee to approve the meetings held on the 7th of November. I would to move that, Madam Chairman. Thank you. And can I get a seconder, please? I don't know who did it. We'll go for <laughs> Councillor Cooper. Sorry, <laughs> you all did it. <laughs> wow, I need to get eyes everywhere. Okay. Um, that's it, I think we can... Yeah, I'll sign those. Declarations of interest. Uh, all those in favour of passing the minutes? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item. Okay, so before we move on, can I ask if anybody's got a de declaration of interest? Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. I won't go into too many details. The uh, second item we'll be considering tonight, which is the former police station at Tamworth, and I will certainly remember. Um, I was heavily involved in the attempts of this council to purchase the site and the backwards and forwards that took part there and the considerations around you know compulsory purchase and everything went on. From a personal perspective, and Anna will remember this, it left a very bad taste in my mouth. I'm not going to go into any details in case I prejudice committee, but I don't feel I'm in a place where I can make a rational judgment on this particular item, so I'm choosing to step out of it and say no more about it. Okay, thank you. Any more declarations of interest? No? Okay, um, agenda item number four is appointment of the vice chair. Have I got a nomination? Yeah. Uh, can I second that nomination, please? Okay. Any other nominations? Take a vote on yeah, can yeah. we take a vote? All in favour of Councillor Danny Cook? I'll we'll see you now and again. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we move on to agenda item number five, which is for planning 2412018, land north of Browns Lane, Tamworth. <sighs> can I hand over to the planning officer for a presentation, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. So this application relates to a wider site of housing development for up to 210 houses, public open space, landscaping, sustainable urban drainage, access and associated infrastructure within the administrative boundaries of Litchfield District Council. The following slide here shows the extent of the development site. The residential element obviously is to the east with um, lads area of landscaping to the west. This application was refused by Litchfield District Planning Committee on Monday the 27th of November for the following two reasons. Uh, number one, it's not allocated for development within their adopted local plan, and they also saw a lot of impacts with the scheme with the village of uh, Wigington, situated to the north of the site, just out of shot. For Tamworth, it's the access of the site which lies within its administrative boundary, as slow shown here. As the report sets out, this will provide a discordant form of development to approve an access road to a site which is not approved, despite being of an appropriate proportions and with good landscaping at either side. As a result, this application is recommended for refusal, uh, refusal sorry, as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Councillor Robert Pritchard to speak as an objector for the application, please. <coughs> Councillor Pritchard, because you are the only objector, we are giving you the six minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll do my best not to be six minutes. I'll keep it as brief as I can. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak against this application and represent the views of many local people. Uh, I've personally been campaigning against North Tamworth border dumping for over a decade, and I hope to explain why this application should be refused. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to the objections of local residents, Wigington and Hotwas Parish Council, uh, the evidence uh, submitted to Litchfield District Council uh, by Tamworth Borough Council planning officers and as well as the refusal by Litchfield District Council. 
The objections and the refusal by Litchfield should be given weight by the committee and provide adequate and robust reasons to refuse this application. And I also uh, draw members' attention to the continued outcry since the consultation period closed on social media about this site. Um, this site would extend the conurbation of Tamworth far too close to the neighbouring uh, village of Wigginton, and the site is also not in uh, the existing local plan of either Tamworth or Litchfield, uh, and goes against many uh, individual policies of both authorities. Uh, but there are more reasons uh, to refuse this that aren't sort of expressed in a, a written report, and I am pleased to have the opportunity to do that in person. The application represents a substantial threat to the identity of the village of Wigginton, which is on our borders, uh, a quite old village that was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Um, it will see the north boundary of Tamworth extended closer and closer to that existing settlement. Um, the village it will basically become at risk of being swallowed up uh, by the borough of Tamworth, fundamentally changing this, this historic village's identity, and I believe this is wrong. The development will change the identity of North Tamworth, especially Browns Lane. Again, this is wrong. Uh, it's another site like Arkle Farm and Browns Lane 1 that is essentially urban expansion of the borough of Tamworth but inside another authority. The development will access the highways network and the infrastructure from inside of Tamworth Borough. It will use Tamworth facilities and uh, its residents will believe they're Tamworth despite being inside another local authority and disconnected from the district services they actually financially contribute towards. Browns Lane residents have suffered enough with the previous development and with the expansion of Arkle Farm, it has to stop somewhere. Where is our line in the sand when it comes to this border dumping in the north of Tamworth? The rapidly expanding Tamworth footprint is radically altering the environment around Tamworth and our green spaces are being eaten away. It's also changing the parish of Wingington and Hopwas. The parish was originally three small villages and it's now doubled in size with the two disconnected developments in North Tamworth being Arkle Farm and Browns Lane, with Arkle Farm potentially being up to a thousand houses. With the continued growth of Arkle Farm, uh, we are basically at risk of fundamentally changing this uh, identity in the north of Tamworth and um, the, 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 what residents recognise as, as sort of this community being fundamentally changed. The infrastructure impact of this development cannot be downplayed. As I've raised with Staffordshire County Council, the area is a traffic bottleneck regardless of the schools being open or not. The, this is old Tamworth with little ability to alter the road network and the traffic impact uh, was last assessed at the tail end of the COVID pandemic and I think it's time that that's refreshed. The proposals also place further strain on our community infrastructure and as mentioned there's little space in this side of Tamworth for new community facilities, educational capacity or infrastructure. We can't build new GP surgeries, new community centres or new schools, there is no room. Tamworth can't sustain this uh, urban, continued urban creep, um, and it's, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, and this is being uh, largely decided inside uh, other planning authorities. The development is also another development on the green spaces around the borough, and it's getting bigger and bigger despite continued public outcry. The town is growing more and more, and it is losing uh, its green buffer zone around it. And I again repeat the point that Browns Lane residents have been most impacted by the development of Browns Lane 1, the disruption to traffic, noise, the loss of the environment and the inevitable antisocial behaviour. In terms of the developers' proposals to make this 100% affordable, I believe they're trying to cheat the planning system. Uh, it's not providing for Tamworth Borough Council's need. Uh, by our own measurement, we are meeting our own affordable need, so their argument that that um, is for the benefit of Tamworth should be discounted. Uh, furthermore, the uh, push to make this 100% affordable would actually bypass the uh, bypass the uh, SIL uh, system because they could be eligible for 100% um, relief. So therefore, again, uh, draining potential funding to try and mitigate against some of the impacts on the borough. The argument presented by the developer um, should be completely discounted by the committee. I urge the committee to accept the officer's recommendation and refuse the application be for a number of reasons, protecting uh, an historic village on our border, protecting the site allocation framework in our neighbouring local plans, acknowledging the impact on local, local infrastructure, protecting against another unfair border dump or ex simply accepting that this is the wrong place. Whatever your reasons, uh, I beg you to say no. I think, it's, uh, I think there's a whole host of policy reasons the committee can cite. Um, for our neighbouring authority of Litchfield, of which the, you know, the lion's share of this site is in, it goes against their, their plans CP1, CP3, CP14, BE1, NR5 of their local plan strategy, policy B2 of their site allocation document, 
the historic environment uh, and designs uh, sustainable uh, development policy. Policies W1, WHC and WHC3 of the Wigington and Hopwas and Cumberford Neighbourhood Plan and our own policies NE5 and our, our Interpretation of National uh, Planning Policy Framework. This application is unwelcome by all and it is another of a long list of border dumping developments in Tamworth. It will change the identity of North Tamworth, which is wrong. It will change the character of our surrounding uh, community space and our surrounding sort of village identity. Again, this is wrong, so I beg the committee to refuse this application, be it against continued urban creep or the flurry of unsustainable develop development in our area. Please do the right thing tonight and say no to Browns Lane 2. Thank you. I think that was actually spot on six, mon uh, six months, <laughs> six minutes. <laughs> Sorry, that was a fraudulent slip. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions? Sorry, Chair, I just need to declare an interest. Um, basically, I'm a councillor for Hopwas and Wigginton Council, but I'm here tonight as a Tamworth Borough Council, so I don't think that I've got any prejudice with, with the application because I'm here as a Tamworth Borough Council councillor. Thank you. No, I think that's fine. You know, you, you've had no input into the application at all, presumably. No. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I pass it over to the committee for any questions that you've got for officers, please? Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one for the officers, really. Uh, why are we here discussing it if it has been rejected by Litchfield? Um, it kind of puts us in a bit of a difficult situation because if we if we approve it, then it's already been rejected by the neighbouring authority anyway. Um, so we, we, I feel as though we are forced into a situation where we have to reject it. Well, that's correct. Um, ultimately, the patch of access is in our, is our, in our administrative boundary, um, a bad administrative boundary. So we have to determine that parcel of that site. So yes, hence why we've actually had to point to attention the decision by Litchfield District Council to refuse it. Therefore, it'd be prudent for us to do the same. Obviously, we've approved it. We're approving an access road to nowhere. And obviously, he wants to see that. Well, with that in mind, then, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd move to reject and I'd be looking for a seconder. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Happy to um, second that motion. Absolutely um, statement of the obvious, as we all tell. There is legitimate planning reasons for it to arrive here, but you're right, we are a little bit pigeonholed, but it is also, I believe, the right thing to do. Um, just from my own personal uh, perspective, obviously I've been on this council a long time. It's the things that are forgotten that get to me when we talk these developments in the north of town. As Councillor Pritchard will rightly remember, the BWB report from 2013 that set out how much traffic the north of town could take with additional house building. We're so far past that original report, it's unbelievable. And these applications keep arriving. And we went through the monitor and manage situation and the gramping conditions on Apple Farm that took control of traffic conditions. And these applications keep arriving with nobody addressing the infrastructure. And it's got to stop. So absolutely agree with the presentation of Councillor Pritchard, absolutely agree with Councillor Cooper and have it a second. Okay. Shall we move to debate? Councillor Thurgood. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it was in 2018 that um, we were asked to uh, vote on this and it was thrown out on the grounds of the increased traffic load upon Wigington Road, Jewelway Lane, Comberford Road, Coton Lane and what we're seeing now, okay it has been rejected by Litchfield and I agree with um, Councillor Cooper that we're here again discussing um, what our views are on it whereas I think it was solidly um, put in 2018 um, so, on that basis, I'm against, I would, I would go for rejection. Thank you. 
Councillor Maycock. <coughs> Anybody else? No? Okay, so we'll move to the vote then. So, all in favour? So the recommendation is to refuse to grant planning permission. All those in favour? So that's unanimous. Okay, so the next application is 5B0261-2022, conversion of and extension of existing five-storey former police station building to form 54 residential units. So I'd like to pass, pass over to the planning officer, please. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Hello, councillors. Uh, my name is Debbie Hall, and I'm the planning officer dealing with the next item. The application is for the conversion and extension of the former police station north of Spinning School Lane where it meets Marmion Street, reference 0261 2022. It is proposed to retain the central taller building and demolish the single storey elements to the side and also to demolish two single storey outbuildings at the rear. Two four storey extensions would be added to the remaining building. The building is to provide one and two bedroom apartments. The application is reported to committee due to it being a major application and the recommendation is to approve subject to 106. The police station was in use until around May 2019 when the police vacated the premises and moved to a new facility in the Belgrave area of town. So our first slide is the layout plan. The extension to the east would form a reverse L shape measuring approximately 23 metres at the widest part, 43.5 metres deep and a height of 50 metres dropping to 8.7 where it meets the existing dwellings on Marmion Street. The extension to the west would be rectangular shaped and measure approximately 12.5 metres wide and 29 metres deep and have a height of 14 metres except on the northernmost end where it drops to a height of 11. There are two existing access points to the site, one on Spinning School Lane and one on Marmion Street. The access off Spinning School Lane will be retained and the access from Marmion Street will be closed. The site is allocated for housing in the Tamworth local plan. We've got a slide for that. Yep. Um, it's formed from sites 507, 508 and 509. The allocation description confirms the site is located on Brownfield land in the town centre and contains an scheduled ancient monument. The text in the local plan makes reference to a flood risk assess assessment, discussions with heritage bodies and the need for an archaeological assessment. The application has been amended on num numerous occasions to improve the design of the scheme and to meet the high standards of design required by local and national policy. The principal changes to the scheme since the original submission have included a reduction in the number of units from 62 down to 54 and the introduction of three outdoor terraces. Additional information was received relating to heritage ecology and flooding also. Um, the relevant policies are on this slide that you can see here, I won't read them all out. The policies relevant to this application can be seen on the slide and on page 19 in the report. The MPPF policies where they relate to design, housing and heritage assets are particularly relevant as are the local policies relating to those subjects. Planning history, there's no relevant planning um, No relevant planning history. This is the first application to redevelop the site. All previous applications have been from when the building was in use by the police station and related to that use. 
We have consulted widely with regards to statutory and non-statutory consultees. 33 neighbours were consulted, including a mix of residential and commercial properties. No objections have been received from the statutory and non-statutory consultees. Two neighbour objections relating to loss of light, privacy and traffic and noise were received. The proposals were also consulted upon using an officer who has an expert knowledge on good design, which has helped to develop the proposals to a standard where we feel they meet the objectives of the local and national policy. Our next slide here shows the key issues. There are a number of key issues. <clears throat> Firstly, the principle. The local plan was adopted in February 2016 as a starting point for determining any planning application. Within the local plan, the spatial strategy for Tamworth is to provide development in the most accessible and sustainable locations. An SS2 presumption in favour of sustainable development states that proposals that accord with the local plan should be um, approved without delay. The former police station is allocated for housing the local plan in policy HG1, so the principle of developing housing on this location is therefore established and acceptable, subject obviously to compliance with other policies in the plan. Character and appearance. <clears throat> policy in 5, design and new development states that development should be a, a scale, layout and massing which conserves or enhances the setting of the development. The existing building consists of four floors and a basement with the front of the building facing Spinning School Lane. The current building, oh, we've got a picture of the current building. That's it. Um, the current building is finished in pebble dash faced concrete and blue frame windows. On either side of the front are two single story buildings. The site has been vacant for a while and as a consequence it's beginning to look unkept. Um, there's natural features within sight of two trees on the corner where Spinning School Lane and Marmion Street meet and some other occasional planting. The building is surrounded by hard surface car, car parks um, to the south, which is Spinning School Lane car park, and to the east, Marmion Street car park. And then you've got the Magistrates Court to the west, and to the north is the car park serving the youth centre beyond. Adjacent the northeast corner of the site are a row of traditional rendered terrace properties, numbers of 38 to 41 Marmion Street. So we've got some slides of the plans and some, some visuals as well. <clears throat> so this is the uh, south elevation facing Spinning School Lane. We just scroll through them. Now. And that's the um, east elevation facing Marmion Street. And that's looking into the courtyard so you can see the sort of the ends of the extensions on either side. And then the west elevation, which is alongside the access, the access road in. And that's, that's one CGI. And that's the other. We just stay on the CGI now, Glenn, thanks. <clears throat> so the proposed four-storey side extensions would be set back from the front elevation of the retained five-storey building and set down from the existing roof by 0.79 metres. 75 metres, in order that the retained central building remains the dominant feature and the extensions appear subservient. <clears throat> Additional features include an outdoor terrace on the second floor at the far end of the east wing, another outdoor terrace on the third floor on the far east of the end of the west wing, and a final terrace on the third floor on the corner of the building where Spinning School Lane and Marmion Street meet. Um, many of the apartments also have balconies. Barking is located on the east side of the access road in, in the centrally located courtyard, and four spaces are located within the car park at the rear, shared with the youth centre, totalling 40 parking spaces. <clears throat> Cycle parking is proposed adjacent to the rear entrance within the courtyard, and, and there's a bin store uh, on the west side of the courtyard. They're proposing a gym and more cycle parking in the basement. <clears throat> With regards to landscaping, there will be the removal of the two metre high brickwork boundary wall um, to allow for wider landscaping strip on Marmion Street, incorporating grass and plants and bushes. This will be banked up to the building to maintain a constant ground line and minimise the depth of, apparent depth of the brick plinth. The corner to the southeast will also have a grassed area and be planted with a more formal arrangement of bushes and shrubs. <coughs> The existing pedestrian deterrent paving near to the main entrance steps and ramp on Spinning School Lane will be removed and replaced with grass and formal planting. The two metre high security fence on the west side will be removed 
and replaced with a 0.9 metre wide strip of low level planting and bushes. The courtyard will be improved by the provision of paved walkways and planting and bushes in selected areas. Parking bays will be surfaced in block pavers with curb edgings and manoeuvring areas will be relayed, relayed in tarmac. Each flat will contain a lounge kitchen, a bathroom, a store containing a washing machine and one or two bedrooms, some with ensuite to the main bedroom. The predominant finishing material would be red brick with beige terracotta panelling recessed between the windows, as you can see on the slide. <clears throat> the outward facing eleva elevations would each include a picture frame feature constructed from um, powder coated aluminium in dark grey with spandrel panels uh, inside. Um, grey louvers are proposed to screen the motor room for the lift on the roof and the roof fence and the masts. Some balconies will be constructed from black painted railings, whilst others will be glazed. Windows and doors will be powder coated aluminium frames dark, in dark grey, with solar control and heat insulating double glazed units with a grey tint. The council has consulted with an external design consultant on two occasions to review the plans to ensure that the proposals fully reflect the high ambitions of local and national policy on design. As a result of this, the brickwork was changed from buff to red to better reflect the local area. Uh, the plinth bricks went from dark brown to dark red. The inset panels between the windows went from brick to this terracotta light beige colour. The facing materials to the fourth floor of the east elevation has been changed from brickwork to the terracotta um, cladding to create the lighter colour at the top. And there was some of the changes to the entrance area and the post room and, and flat, a, co a couple of the flats, flat number one and 16, to were improved as a result of the um, <coughs> comments from the design consultant. Design considerations. The proposed, the proposed design would retain the main five-storey central building as the dominant feature with the east and west wings appearing subordinate to the main dwelling. The picture frame features on each outward facing elevation introduce a projecting element to the facade with the recessed <coughs> sections between the windows further creating variations in the depth and definition to the elevations. The third floor on the Marmion Street side would be finished, that might be meant to say fourth floor on the Marmion side, would be finished in a lighter colour material to reduce the perceived height of the building along the elevation to Marmion Street. There'd be a mix of finishing materials which introduce different textures and colours. The outdoor terraces, particularly the one on the prominent corner, uh, introduce further features of interest. The grey louvres proposed on the roof to screen the masts and the motor housing for the lift would help to create a more pleasant visual appearance and landscaping is proposed around the base, which will soften the overall appearance from, from pavement level. Other positive design features include where the east wing meets the terrace properties on Marmion Street, the height of the building drops down to two storeys to better tie in with those terraces. Overall, it's considered that the proposed design would create a positive and contemporary building within the street scene and represents what would be a significant improvement over and above what is currently in situ. Furthermore, policy SU3 of climate Climate change mitigation uh, states that appropriate sustainable design, layout, orientation and use of construction materials and methods that reduce embodied energy in their production where feasible is supported. And reusing the existing building instead of demolishing and rebuilding is a much more sustainable method of development. <clears throat> so the character and appearance of the proposed development would therefore enhance the quality of the street scene and is considered to be in compliance with policy EN5. Highway safety and parking. Local plan policy EN5 states that new development will be expected to pay particular regard to highway safety and servicing requirements, the capacity of the local road network and the adopted parking standards set out in Appendix C. It is proposed to use the access from Spingling School Lane, which is currently in the control of the County Council. It is proposed to provide 40 car parking spaces and cycle parking for 54 bikes. Appendix C states that parking for self-contained flats apartments should have one space per flat and visitor spaces at one space per four flats, which makes 68 spaces. So there would be a shortfall of 28 spaces. <coughs> However, policy SU2 states that development with lower levels of parking provision may be acceptable in locations that are highly accessible by walking, cycling and public transport, including Tamworth's network of centres. I think we might have a slide for this. Parking policies. That's it. <clears throat> there, 
Therefore, on account of the site being located in central Tamworth and one of the most sustainable locations within the borough with easily accessible access to the railway station and bus services, the proposed parking is considered to be acceptable. And it is the ambition that most occupants will rely on using more sustainable methods of transport. There are outstanding issues with access to the site from Spinning School Lane due to the access being outside of the applicant's ownership. However, this does not preclude the planning application from being approved as this is a legal matter as opposed to being a material planning matter. County Highways have been consulted upon the proposals and concluded that the proposal is acceptable in terms of parking and highway safety, subject to a number of conditions which have been included, um, are included at the end of the report. <clears throat> Heritage and archaeology. Local plan policy N6, pretending the, protecting the historic environment, states that proposals will be required to pay particular attention to the impact on protected heritage assets. In this case, a scheduled ancient monument and Tamworth Town and Albert Road, Victoria Street conservation areas. The site isn't located within either of these conservation areas, but it would be viewable from both. The northern end of the application site extends into a scheduled monument related to the buried archaeological remains of Tamworth's Saxon and medieval defences. Proposed works in this area include demolition of existing buildings, hard landscaping, new parking, a bin store, etc. These works will all require scheduled monument consent. County Council Historic Environment Team recommended that should permission be granted, an archaeological watching brief would be carried out during any substantial groundworks. <clears throat> The application site, as it is, is of no heritage interest and as such makes no direct contribution to the significance of the conservation area and given its considerable mass is a poor visual presence within the wider setting of this designated heritage asset. As such, the application site is identified as an enhancement site upon the proposals and recommendation plan contained within the Tamworth Town Conservation Area appraisal. The alterations to the existing building will modernise and improve its visual appearance and the extensions to the building are of an appropriate scale, form and construction material. The proposed redevelopment would improve the character and appearance of the, area, of the site and reinstate an active frontage to the street scene. So consequently, the proposal result in enhancement to the wider setting of the Tamworth Town conservation area. A heritage statement has been submitted with this application which states that the conservation areas area appraisal of the Victoria Road, Albert Road conservation area singles out the existing structure as having a negative impact on the setting of the cons conservation area. The proposed changes by improving the visual impact of the structure and bringing life and activity back to an empty corner will enhance the setting of the conservation area. The new development would change the setting of the scheduled monument, however this is considered by Historic England to be like unlikely, to re unlikely to result in harm to its significance, um, subject to the conditions. <clears throat> Amenity. <clears throat> Policy EM5, design and new development states that developments will be expected to minimise or mitigate environmental in impacts for the benefit of existing and prospective occupants of neighbouring land. <clears throat> With regards to those living within close proximity to the development site, the proposal is located adjacent a row of terrace properties on Marmion Street and Albert Road beyond. The design SPD states that two storey or higher extensions should not encroach into an area measured by drawing a 60 degree angle from the midpoint of a neighbour's window or door opening. We have a, a slide for that, brilliant. <clears throat> a plan has been submitted, as you can see, um, showing the proposed extension relative to the existing dwellings and the extension would not encroach into that 60 degree zone. Amended plans were submitted which reduced the height of the extension to two storeys where it meets the row of terraces on Marmion Street in order to reduce the sense of overbearing. Privacy and noise have been addressed by an acoustic screen on the northwest corner of the outdoor terraces. Ob um, objections have been received from the residents of the closest dwelling in that row of terraced housing. However, the impact is judged not to be so significant as to justify refusal. Further objections received from resident living on Albert Road at the rear. The Tamworth Design SPD states that for dwellings of three or more storeys, I don't have a slide for this one, unfortunately. Um, a minimum distance of 30 metres between the rear windows of habitable rooms within opposing dwellings and the rear extremities of any extension will need to be maintained. <coughs> so we ask for 30 metres. In this instance, the distance is 50 metres. And therefore, the scheme complies with the recommended distance between dwellings. 
In terms of the amenity of potential occupiers or future occupiers, the SPD also recommends compliance with the national standards for internal floor space. The proposed units are either one or two beds. For a one bed, two person flat, that standard is 50 metres squared. For a two bed, three person uh, flat, that standard would be 61 metres squared. And for a two bed, four person flat, that would be 70 metres squared. 49 of the 54 residential units have a gross internal floor area which meets those national uh, standards. Five units have a shortfall of 0.3 square metres. However, others exceed the standard. The proposal is a conversion and has got the floor space measurements as close as possible given the confines of the building. Given that the shortfall is small and for only five units and that the remaining units exceed the standard, this is considered to be acceptable. With regards to apartment blocks and amenity space, the design SPD recommends that a minimum of five square metres of outdoor amenity space, where the smallest dimension is not less than 1.5 metres, is provided for one or two person flats, plus an extra one square metre for each additional occupant. On this basis, in order to comply with the design SPD, the total amenity space required to be delivered equates to 354 square metres. A total of 276 square metres of outdoor communal amenity space is provided in the form of the three rooftop terraces. The provision of an external amenity space falls short of the standard recommended in design SPD by 78 square metres. The balconies have been excluded from this calculation as the smallest dimension is less than 1.5 metres and the proposed basement gym has also been excluded. However, these spaces will make a positive contribution to the space to the space available for recreation within the development. Given the town centre location in walking distance to the castle grounds and playground, it is considered that the shortfall in amenity space is acceptable. Environmental protection have been sought on this scheme and have no objections subject to the inclusion of conditions relating to noise, light and dust. Ecology. <coughs> Policy EM4, protecting and enhancing biodiversity of the local plan states development will be required to demonstrate appropriate mitigation ensure no negative impact on ecology and diversity. With a development such as this one being proposed here, this, is, this can include measures such as bat boxes and planting of appropriate species. The site currently consists largely of either buildings or hard standing. It is proposed to demolish some of the existing building and outbuildings which are potential habitats for bats and therefore a bat survey has been submitted at the request of the county ecologist. Report states that there is no evidence of bats within any part of the proposed development. However, conditions relating to uh, development being carried out carefully with the expectation that bats and nesting birds may be found are recommended. The county ecologist has requested boxes for bats, birds, invertebrates. She's requested a landscape plan, ecology report, in order that biodiversity net gain is achieved in line with MPPF paragraph 180. Contamination. Policy SU5 pollution, ground conditions and minerals and soils states that development should manage the risk of air, light noise, ground or water pollution and land instability. Being a brownfield site, there is potential presence of contaminated land and therefore a condition covering this matter is recommended. A scheme specifying the provisions to be made to control dust emanating from the site and to deal with the management and or safe disposal of asbestos is required. Environmental protection have also been consulted on this proposal and have reviewed the technical information sent by the developer in coming to their recommendation to approve subject to these conditions. <coughs> Flooding and drainage. Policy SU4, flood risk and water management states that all new development, including regeneration proposals, will need to demonstrate that there is no increased risk of flooding to existing properties. The site is within flood zone one, has a low probability of flooding from rivers and a very low risk from surface water flooding. Foul sewage is to discharge the public combined sewer and surface water is to discharge to the public surface water sewer. Seven Trent Water have been consulted on this and accept these proposals. The lead local flood authority are satisfied with the information provided and have no objections subject to a pre-commencement condition. Affordable housing. Policy HG4 states that the council will require new residential development, including 10 or more dwellings, to provide 20% affordable dwellings on site. Therefore, as a development of 54 dwellings, 11 affordable units should be provided, ideally on site. Ideally, that affordable housing should be three first homes, three affordable home ownership tenures, and five affordable dwellings delivered as affordable rented tenures. 
split between social and affordable rent. Research has suggested housing associations can sometimes be reluctant to take on affordable dwellings in apartment blocks. If this was to occur, a contribution based on the formula provided in the Planning Obligations SPD would be requested and negotiated as part of the Section 106. Housing mix. Policy HG5, housing mix, states that in granting planning permission for residential development to housing sizes and types that reflect local needs will be secured. The 2019 Housing and Employment Needs Assessment sets out that both two- and three-bedroom dwellings are collectively in the greatest need across Tamworth. The proposal provides five one-bed and 49 two-bed properties and therefore does fall short in reflecting the desired dwelling mix preferred by Policy HG5. Policy HG5, however, should be considered a starting point from which the most site-appropriate mix can be determined and any significant deviation appropriately justified. In this case, a statement from a local estate agent has been provided detailing why both three and four beds would not be suitable for either the location or the site, and why the alternative mix is more appropriate. Whilst the proposed housing mix does not comply with policy HG5, given the overriding need for two beds identified and the advice of the local estate agent, the proposed housing mix is considered to be acceptable. Housing density. Policy HG6 Housing Density states that new residential development will make efficient and effective use of land whilst enhancing the character and quality of the area it is located in. Within or in close proximity to the town centre, a density of 40 dwellings per hectare or greater is expected. As the density is 172.8 dwellings per hectare, the proposal complies with policy HG6. Open space. Policy EN3 states that all new housing development should be within 400 metres of accessible, high-quality open space, as defined in the Open Space Review 2012. New on-site on open space should be provided where this is not the case, using a standard of 2.43 hectares per thousand population as a guide. Where it is not appropriate to create new on-site open space, all new housing developments should contribute towards improving the quality and accessibility of nearby off-site open spaces. This includes Section 106 payments towards these quality improvements. In this instance, it's not possible for the scheme to include open space that fully accords with the policy, given the limited land available, and therefore a financial contribution of £660 per dwelling will be negotiated through the Section 106. In conclusion, the proposal is for the conversion extension of Form Police Station to Form 54 residential units, the proposal relates to, an, relates to an existing building that has been in use as a police station and therefore there are build constraints to changing the use to residential. Reusing the building instead of demolishing and rebuilding is, is, is a much more sustainable method of development. Numerous changes to the proposal have been achieved to ensure the scheme meets the highest standard of design. There are recognised aspects of the scheme that do not fully meet plan policy, but justica justifications have been provided where necessary. The scheme is acknowledged to not fully accord with parking standards contained in Appendix C. However, policy SU2 states that development with lower levels of parking provision may be acceptable in locations that are highly accessible by walking, cycling and public transport, as is the case for this site. <coughs> It has been also been recognised that the proposal is, is deficient in external private amenity space, however, as there are balconies and a gym, and given the town centre location near the castle, this is considered to be acceptable. Together with the balconies that are proposed, the scheme provides the quantum of amenity space to meet <coughs> local plan policy. With regards to internal space standards, the efficiency here is marginal and the best that could be achieved given the restrictions the designer is working with. With regards to all other matters, the proposal complies with the relevant policies. No objections have been received from consultees and is therefore recommended for approval, subject to conditions under Section 106. The Section 106 contributions include the education requirements, health care provision, open space and potentially affordable housing units, which all provide benefits to local infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll pass it over to the committee for any questions for the officers. Thank you.
Okay, Councillor Coates. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the first one is to do with the recommendation um, and part eight B, the £35,100 for local health care provisions. Um, can you tell me where that's going, please? I don't remember, but I think that the um, comments um, received did specify um, what it would be for, because I think they're required to do that. I think they are required when they ask for the monies that they, um, they specify what it's going to be used for. Um, and all the consultee comments are uh, available on the website. Um, so you can have a read of what they said. But I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what they said that it was going to be used for. <laughs> I'll see if we can find out. Yeah. We'll have a little look, see if we can, see if we can have a read. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's just because we've lost another dentist in Tamworth and there's a lot of healthcare um, issues, you know, getting services. So I just wanted to know where it was going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to draw back onto the communications with local residents. How was this achieved, please, in the consultation? We sent them letters, and the site notice. The site notice went up as well. There was there wasn't any sort of pre pre consultation. If that was what you were you were thinking. Yeah, I just think so we've just it, we, we, it was just the consultation that we did. I don't think there was any there wasn't, wasn't any other consultation. Was there? Um, so it, it's just in line with our own procedures, which is a sort of neighbour notification and also a, like a site notice in a prominent place to sort of pick up those people who wouldn't have got a notification. But we don't have a requirement for developers to consult with um, local communities. Quite often they do, but that's something that they do um, voluntarily. It's not actually in policy that they do that. So it hasn't been. So we haven't had it in this case. I'd be interested to see how many people in that local area are aware of this planning application. Um, because I, th I think if we're talking about uh, 54 apartments in the town centre uh, overlooking uh, other residential houses. I, don't, I, I would have liked to have seen more consultation done with members of the public for the impact because for me it's not just those people that live around that area this is a town centre location so it's, it's going to impact everybody with who who lives in the town um so yeah i, I would have expected to rather just a few letters be sent out a, a little bit more you know a, a public consultation forum at least just so that everybody in the town has a say because it's, it's going to impact a lot more than just the people in the on, on that street Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So just going back to the um, NHS question and um, the consultation response, I'll read it in full. Um, after considering the key facets associated with practices that fall within influencing distance of this site, uh, the ICB or the um, clinical board uh, is requesting a contribution which will support the delivery or development of primary care services in the Mercian PCN. Um, so a lot of calculations, a lot of data has gone into that calculation. Um, within the Mercy PCN, they are registered the Laurel House Surgery, the Hollies Medical Centre, Aldergate Medical Practice and the Peel Medical Practice. Um, there's a little table provided on the uh, consultation response, breaks it all down in terms of how many, or how, how the housing that's going to be provided, the household average, and then yeah, calculations in terms of all the um, extra resources that will create and the calculation has been done on the floral area that that would generate and the total cost is yeah generated at 40 30,300 pounds but if you refer to that table it gives you all that breakdown information in terms of how that's been calculated yeah very precise as it has to be to meet the various tests of selection 106 contribution payments okay. uh, thank you for that so it's been split between four practices basically 35,000 pounds yep Okay, thank you. Councillor Adams. I would like to know how you expect for parking to work in reality because most people have like one car, sometimes even two, and you've got 10 mates in. They're going to be fighting over car park spaces.
Um, the intention is that um, the 40 parking spaces will be allocated to particular apartments. So you will either buy an apartment with a parking space or you will buy an apartment without a parking space. Um, so we're trying to encourage some more uh, sustainable modes of transport. So if you if you know you're buying an apartment without a, a without a car parking space, then you you know you, you use somebody who is going to get the train basically. Um, so yeah. And just to say, it's 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 a sustainable town centre location. Couldn't be more sustainable, really, in Tamworth, with the distance to buses, trains, walking distance to services, facilities and amenities. Um, and there are a lot of public car parks in the vicinity. Um, so I think the expectation is that if you haven't got a car parking space, you'd have to use public car parks, um, which are free from six o'clock in the evening till eight in the morning. Um, so you'd have to you'd have to pay if you park during the day. Um, so that's the expectation. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Chair. From a highways point of view, just to reiterate what you just heard, um, site is an allocated site in your local plan for housing. It's banging the town centre. And I've just got some stats here, just to reiterate the point, what you've heard. From this site to Tamworth Rail Station is approximately seven minutes walk, less than half a mile. It's a five minute walk from this site to Victoria Road, where some of the bus stops are to Glasgow, Stony Delph, etc. And probably another five minutes walk to Corporation Street to the next set of bus stops, which take you down to Birmingham or wherever. So for those that do not have a flat, with a car parking space you know you're not getting a parking space you choose to buy that flat on that knowledge that you are seven minutes walk away to a train station or five minutes walk away to a bus service the site is surrounded by car parks you've heard that there is a lack of visitor spacing on the site when we've looked at it it's surrounded by public car parks so we're not expecting visitors to park within the site because there is a provision around the site. There's also WLR lines on the road network, so we're not expecting people to park in Marmion Street, et cetera, because I know it's a one-way system. So from a highways point of view, we've looked at it from your policy point of view. I think it's already been mentioned, policy issue two, that says cycling, walking, public transport should come first in sustainable sites it doesn't get better than this we can only object as we've said regarding NPPF the national planning policy framework on whether a development would cause a severe impact on the highway network now what you've got to remember from a traffic movement point of view the police station would have had cars coming in and out all day whether that be shift changes or whether that be officers coming or going with their day-to-day -day business so we don't see a huge difference in the volume of traffic the site would generate. So we cannot look at NPF and say this would cause a severe impact on the network in terms of its change of use. And the only other option we have to refuse on highway grounds is would it have a safety impact? And that goes back to what I've just said in terms of the location, it's sustainable, there are other parking alternatives and as the planning office has already said I think we've got 54 cycle parking spaces so those that choose to buy a flat without a parking space can choose to park on a public car park which is free overnight or knowing they are seven minutes walk and probably a lot less cycle journey to a railway station to make a commute to work that is a lifestyle choice so from a highway point of view from a parking point of view we have not objected because we do not believe we have grounds to object using the MPPF and your policies. I hope that's useful. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, when it comes to the 11 affordable homes, will there be one or two bedroom flats or is it going to be a balance between the two?
There will be one or two bed because there's only been one or two bed being built. But I don't I don't know. Um, no, I, I don't know how many of the affordables will be one beds and how many of the affordables will be two beds. I don't I don't know how how we decide that. I don't know if Richard knows how that works. Um, yeah, it would just be negotiated through the, the Section 106 agreement that was referred to, and normally within those agreements it will set out which particular units are to be affordable units. So um, we would obviously um, consult with the um, housing team on need and see if that makes a difference to the ones and twos, and then agree on that basis, I would guess. Thank you. Councillor Woodrop, did you? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, you're next. <laughs> yeah, I was just asking, is um, any of the properties um, going to be adapted for the use of people with disabilities? Because they're few and far between. I think that's really important, especially for the affordable housing. Yeah, I, I mean, they'll have, to, they'll have to comply with building regs. Um, and I don't know if there's measures within building regs to ensure that all of them to a point will be um, accessible, yeah. but not specially adapted, not necessarily now. Sorry, I'm just asking the question because, that, as I said, disability property is adapted to few and far between anyway. Yeah. So would it be useful if the developers for the affordable rented, for the rented accommodation to have at least one? that is adapted for the use of somebody with disabilities or, you know, a couple? Yeah, I'm sure that's possible. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question's actually been answered uh, in relation to the transport, so I'm, I'm okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to I want to draw back onto the uh, car parking. I think um, to state that there's enough car parking there because there's a few public car uh, spaces around. I, th I think that's a little bit of a naive assumption. Um, if yeah, you, you, there's there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be just dumping cars because then they're, they're not, they're not going to pay for them. The, the first portal call is always going to right. Where can I put my car for free? And then if there's nowhere else, then of course they'll go and they'll go and pay. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was how was the impact done on on the traffic uh, situation? Because you're right, what you're saying, the police station uh, used to be there. Um, and we know, I know there's a, there's a few people that, that won't want to admit that there is actually a police station up at Belgrave, but actually there is, and it was moved there because the police wanted better response times due to the traffic around the area. So if we're, if we're going to put in another 54 um, apartments with, with probably 54 cars, let's be, let's be honest, um, that is going to impact on an already busy traffic area. We've got the, the Gungate Throat, which is just off that uh, residential uh, uh, area. And it's probably quite possibly one of the, the busiest um, um, uh, sort of road networks within this town. So uh, how, how have we done that, uh, that, that traffic uh, you know, appreciation survey and, and how was that, what was that done? How, how was that based on? Thank you. Um, the simplest way to explain it is a land use, which the police station has, the land use class has a generation, has a generation. The housing is a different land use class, which also has a generation. So per class has a trip generator. So you take what's existing generates X, you take Y that's proposed and you see what the difference is. And that's a national way of looking at land use equals a trip. And that's a standard way across the country, whether you're sitting in Hampshire planning committee or you're in a Cumbria planning committee, it's the same analysis that takes place in terms of transport planning. So a land use generates a certain amount of trips and a different land use generates a certain amount of trips. And you see whether it's more or less. So given 
And I understand what you're saying about congestion, but given the existing land use that was as the police station, of the comings and goings of that land use associated with residential. So generally, residential will only have trips away in the morning and trips coming back in the week. You will get more trips at a weekend coming and going with shopping. As where well with the land use as a police station, it's a constant coming and going during the days because obviously they go in to do the shifts. They will pick a police car up, go out, come back with prisoners maybe. So there's a lot more movements taking place with that use than a residential use because you will generally go away from it in the morning to work and you will come back in the day. Yes, more at a weekend. So in the sense it's been assessed on the standard protocol. And I've said before, we've not seen it as causing a severe impact because that's the only way we can object using the rules and regulations in the National Planning, Planning Policy Framework. I understand what you're saying in terms of your observation that the area is congested, but by taking the land use result from a police station to the land use result as housing, we don't see that as much different. So you would see it still being congested in your eyes, in your observation, but we don't see that as being severely made worse by the proposal in terms of the amount of vehicles that the site would generate. I don't know whether that's answering the question or not. Go on, far away. Yeah, I find that bizarre that we just use some kind of calculation that's used all over the country to form an opinion of, of what is essentially a very unique, um, a unique uh, road layout. Um, it's a one-way system. Essentially, people are going to come in, they're going to go out, and you've, you've got a load of extra cars going up that one way, pointed in one direction, and that is to Gungate Junction, which, uh, as, as I've said previously, is the, well, probably the busiest junction in the town, um, which suffers a myriad of issues with regards to road surface um, that, that we've, our, our county councils have just, just started to sort out and get on top of. That's cost a million pound out of a, a, a county council money. Um, yeah, I can't see how um, a very um, simple, probably arguably diametric calculation to, to judge the impacts of 54 dwellings inside a town centre, which are predominantly going to be used for commuters, um, is, is, is what, uh, what impact that has on that very busy junction. I, I, I struggle to accept that. Thank you. Councillor Claymore. Thank you, Chair. I think, yeah, mine is really um, another question about the parking, but I think it's partly been answered, so I can leave mine for debate, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Maycock. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to know um, what map it was consulted for the Saxon Wall. Sorry, can you repeat that question? What map was consulted for the location of the Saxon Wall? Um, yeah, that, I, I didn't consult any map. I just took the advice of the statutory consultee, the um, county archaeology. Um, it's not something that I would investigate myself. I would, I, I consult them, and 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 they tell me. <laughs> so they're the, the experts on this watching brief. Who's going to be there to do the watching? Oh, a specialist. Yeah, an archaeological specialist. They'll have to pay for that specialist to do the watching brief. And, and, and if the, there is anything found, will that just be photographed, uh, documented and refilled back in, or will that be moved to a location such as the castle? Well, uh, the specialist doing the watching brief, I imagine will provide the advice with in, with in that regard depends what if what they find I guess I mean yeah it depends what they find what to, as to what the advice would be as to what to do with it because I've found the map and that's literally cutting straight across the northeast corner of the car park where the extension is going to be so the foundations will actually be put where the the the, the, the monuments classed as being so who, who would foot the bill of that being taken out? The developer. 
thank you. Uh, Councillor Thurgood. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of my concerns was the location of the uh, archaeological, archaeological uh, remains. Um, and I, did, I think I saw somewhere that the possibility it would be excavated and then concreted over uh, within the report. I can't remember exactly where, but um, when I was reading it earlier, uh, I saw that. But my fear is that we, we do lose our um, archaeological um, remains. Um, I guess they're buried now, and once they are excavated, then we understand what's there. But if they are really, really important um, artefacts, um, foundations, that we could actually lose them again for another few generations uh, until it's dug up again. Um, as seen on the HS2 um, route near Kozel, where they discovered a whole gateway. And when I passed it last time, it had been covered over, hopefully not destroyed, and, and, and that's the f sort of fear that I have there. Um, <coughs> so, so I think you've answered the question in terms of it will be monitored and hopefully um, suitable action taken on it on that. Um, a second question um, is regard to the, the, the popular topic of parking. What provision is there for emergency vehicles to actually go in if there is requirements, be it fire, whether it's ambulances, whatever? Because I know the road I live in, um, we have a terrible problem with ambulances trying to get down the road because it's so narrow, um, as well as car parking for school. But my, my thought is there that um, on the, um, the Aldergate developments that happened uh, a while back, we spent a long, long time talking about ambulances, having access to it, being wagons going in, being able to turn around. But these, have these considerations been um, reviewed? Yeah, there's um, plans have been submitted um, showing the tracking mm -hmm. um, for, for waste vehicles, and I'm assuming any other large vehicle, you know, um, fire engines as well. And, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, there, um, these details were requested by highways very early on, um, as far as access for those sorts of vehicles is concerned. So you're actually concerned. telling me that there is provision there for that? Yeah. Okay. Um, plans, yeah. Can I ask if there is a, um, a management company in place for running the flats? Uh, there isn't at the moment, but because it's be. very early days, but there will have to be one, yes. In terms of the shortfall of parking, we, we have across the road um, multiple car parks. Um, I would have thought it would be good economic sense for the shortfall to actually um, put in X number of spots that could be permanent um, available parking slots for the flats much as we find in the anchor side uh, flats, where in the multi-storey there, there's an area that residents can park their cars. Um, I support the, 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 the thoughts that people may buy a flat at a lower price, but um, eight, well, six o'clock till eight o'clock, if they are sick, then they're facing quite a bill to actually park that car. Um, and it would make sense for the management company to negotiate with the council um, to actually provide an area where they could actually park. Um, the, the other thing I thought of was there was talk about Aldergate, now Gungate, the development there, which I guess we're waiting on various things to happen, but that could actually remove available parking from that area. Now, I know it's down the road a little while, um, but what consideration takes place for future developments in that area and the impact it will have upon them, the people in, within it? Um, thank you. I think you've raised some really good queries and questions there. I mean, Gungate South, which is opposite this site, 
you know, that is one of our regeneration sites. Um, it's currently surface car park and it, it contains a lot of um, car parking spaces and also generates a lot of revenue for the authority. And let's let's be clear about that. Um, but but we are intending to redevelop it long term. Um, whether we replace the car parking and do something is has yet to be decided. Uh, but we have talked about that in the past with various master plans that we've we've publicly consulted upon. So the area opposite on Gungate South may not in the future be available for car parking. I think we have to <coughs> kind of make that clear. Maybe there'll be some, but on the whole, I think we're looking at something quite significant and very comprehensive on that site. Um, so, and the same can be said for Gungate North, uh, not currently used for car parking, but again, it's a regeneration site that we're trying very hard. And for both sites, we're, we're, we're very close to assembling the land for both to allow us then to move forwards with, with what goes there um, and, and how that will ultimately be delivered in the future. Um, so car parking will be more of a challenge in the future, potentially. Um, you still have the Albion Street car park, the Marmion Street car park, which is sort of on the eastern side of the, the elevations that you've seen. They're just uh, opposite on the other side of the road. Um, so there are there is that public car park, which is in very close vicinity. We know it's heavily used by people who use the train station and it fills up very quickly in the morning by people who who use that. I think it's slightly cheaper than the rail but it's so close that it's easy to walk to. So, you know, that does get used and it does get does get full. Um, just to, I think, answer one of your other questions, could we allocate spaces? We've had no approach to do that. Um, so that's not something that I would comment on and it wouldn't be necessarily for planning to make a decision on, on that, particularly here, without that information. Um, but obviously we would have to be careful doing that given our regeneration plans um, that we have. But what I can say is that we, we do run a, a parking permit system within the authority. So you can, for an annual cost, park in any public car park, not just the ones uh, that are in that vicinity. And it's cheaper than, than parking Monday to Friday and, and, and buying a ticket if you worked in the town, for example. So there are there is a permit that's available and that might perhaps be something that residents would have to, to to purchase if they wanted that close proximity of parking in one of the public car parks. Um, what, just finally, what I would say about our regeneration plans is that you know they're not short term, as in immediate. They're sort of more medium term once we've assembled, got plans in place, permissions. So that's not something that would necessarily disappear overnight, but potentially over a couple of years, two, three, four years, those spaces might not be so available. It's, it's difficult to quantify what's going to happen. It's difficult to make decisions off the back of it. And there are no plans in front of us today to say that's allocated for regeneration or there is an application in for regeneration, but that's always been a council intention and it's one that we've been, that's been made very clear over the years. Thank you, Chair. You. I've got a question actually. So, with regards to car parking spaces, how many spaces have we got in the town? How many car parking spaces are there? Uh. <laughs> I feel under pressure now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, I think it's about twelve hundred, and I think that I think that includes. Anchorside, which is not one of ours, I think. Mm, uh, yeah. So if we said we've got 1,200, I don't know how many, how many we've got in Anchorside, but what would we say the usage is of those spaces? We have, ha we have had some work done. We do need to do more work, I have to say, before we move into regeneration of Gungate. Um, but we do have an oversupply of car parking. We've got more spaces than demand. However, um, it's not all in our control. That's the first. So that that's a you know that's a risk. Um, but secondly, we are regenerating the town centre with the Future High Streets Fund, as you know, and we're bringing into the town centre a new user, which is the South Staffs College, 
which is going to have a significant number of pupils and lecturers coming in every day where we previously hadn't. And so whilst, whilst we haven't perhaps got the demand now and an oversupply, the intention is to, to build that up to not only address the fact that the college will need more parking ultimately, but we are also trying to improve the town centre as a whole and increase footfall, more people enjoying the town centre, etc. So whilst there definitely is an oversupply, um, you know, I think we've just got to bear in mind that we are trying to draw more people in and some of those will come by car. I think it's inevitable. Thank you. Any more questions? Councillor Maycock. Cheers, Chair. Uh, can we just go to um, point four on the conditions? I think it might be a typo, but it, it says under condition A, but there is no condition A. I think perhaps A was the scheme shall provide details of the programme of archaeological works to be carried out within the site, maybe. Is that, is that the A there? A relates to oh, yeah, A. Yeah, I think that's a typo, basically. So B and C should be B and A? And then, the, and then or, that A is referring to what is or B? Or some part of that first paragraph was potentially A. What does it say? The way I wrote that, we do it like this now. What did, it, yeah, what, did it, what did it say originally? So A is prior to the commencement of the development hereby permitted a written scheme of archaeological investigation. Yeah, that's, okay. that's correct so far. Yeah. Oh, there should be an A beginning of the word prior. Prior, okay. Um, also, can it be put within uh, the condition that, because in that condition there it doesn't state anything about the developer having to incur costs of removing any archaeological findings, or, 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 unless yeah. that what unless that's what archive deposition has been secured means at the bottom of C. Let's see. I mean, these conditions are given to us. We don't. I, I haven't written that condition. It's it's di sort of dictated to me by um, County Archaeology. Um, it's a standard condition that they provide us with, and we we put it in. Whether then it, whether there's any more any scope for being more specific about the fact that the developer has to pay for all these works. Um, I mean, it's just normal procedure. That's just what happens, and I think developers accept that and know that they you know they pay for it, and then that's. Any developer who's got any experience anyway doing developments knows that they're, they're going to pay for it. Uh, and possibly, yeah, we could we could go back to the county and say, can you can we be more specific about who's actually going to pay for this? Uh, but like I say, I'm not the specialist when it comes to archaeology, and so they tell me what conditions to put in. And if I would if I were to change that particular condition, I'd want to go back to county you know county archaeology potentially and say, you know this. This is what we're going to put in it. I don't know if Anna, you think we can edit that condition without county archaeology, or whether it's just accepted that the developer's going to pay for it. And I think I think because it's a standard condition that we would put on any application because county archaeology would ask us to in that format, which they probably send to every local authority in Staffordshire. I wouldn't necessarily want to change it without their agreement. <laughs> It's a pre it's, yeah, yeah. It's a pre commencement condition. 
So prior to the commencement of the development, so they're not getting anywhere until they've until they've dealt with that. And yeah, I mean the, the, develop, the, the developers for this particular site are they've developed other sites previously, so I'm sure they understand that they've got to pay for that. I, I just want to come back a bit on that. I mean, they, they, they may have dealt with other sites, but I'm not sure they're going to be dealing with a 15. 100 year old defensive wall there's not many of them about in the country so i'm not sure that they've they've going to have dealt with a development such as Councilor this Maycock, could we just bring in yeah. Stuart? yeah chair if i can uh, through you i think perhaps uh, the way of dealing with this is and i can understand the uh, reluctance to actually uh, do any alterations to what is probably a standard uh, condition which is used by the county archaeologist but if members were uh, in, uh, do you agree to approve this tonight? This is subject to the completion of a Section 106 agreement. Now, this is going to allow ample opportunity for officers to actually consult and speak to the county archaeologist, and in that period of time to see whether uh, the cost point is actually dealt with, and then that answer would c could come back through the chair of planning committee and you could be uh, reassured in that way. I think it's a very prudent question, but there's certainly opportunity to find out uh, what the answer is. Uh, Councillor Coates. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking through the Tamworth Borough Council consultees, um, I noticed the strategic housing officer sent no response. Is there any reason for that? Consider it's a housing development and there's no response from the housing uh, officer. I thought that was a bit strange. Thank you. Um, that, I, I can't tell anyone that really. They didn't respond and, and they, they quite often don't respond. Um, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Thayergood. Thank you, Chair. Um, one final question, and that is the houses on uh, Marmion Street um, closest to the development. Um, whilst the um, upper level, is it 11 metres, something like that, um, which is levelled with the roof of um, those buildings, um, they presumably have back gardens, and will they be overlooked? And is there any concerns for privacy uh, for those buildings? Um, built into our proposals. Thank you, Chair. They're proposing a, a screen that will extend 5.8 metres in either direction on the corner that would be closest to the garden so that there wouldn't be any loss of privacy. And that's um, also going to be an acoustic screen so there, there would also hopefully not be issues with noise. Councillor Adams. I've got two questions. One, are anyone checked for concrete in the old police station? What can we use? We use because it might act weak, like falling down and might not be safe to reuse. And the second one, if we find something on a dig or it maze, could it be come back to planning committee to decide if we want even to go ahead in case do we find something? what need to, can't be moved, but we want to keep. Just having a debate on this side of the table. I had that question before. Um, I, I don't think um, that the safety of the structure or the quality of the concrete or, or, or whatever the concern is, I don't think that's a material planning consideration. And we're just here tonight to, with the proposal that's in front of us and the designs and, and, and everything else, a, a, approve or refuse it, you know, but I. If there's an issue with the building when they get started and 
do whatever they need to do to to build the proposal if, if they run into problems that that is going to be their issue as a developer n not our issue for consideration now it, that's my feeling unless anyone on this side of the table is no okay oh your second question sorry what was that my second question if we find something i do like it's something like a wall piece what we can't move could you go back to planning committee before so we can decide if we actually want anything to be built again if we find something big or it can't be moved do you mean something archaeological yes. underground yes substructure yeah i think that's the role of the watching brief which is conditioned as part of the application which is fairly standard so there will be an archaeological heritage consultant and when it's called a watching brief they they literally stand there while trenches are dug maybe for foundations or whatever and they will watch and and view and record whatever they see um depending on what they find will depend on you know the impact that might have down the line and if they find a saxon palace you know that's going to be quite a significant issue for the developer um, if they find, you know, a clay pipe from the Victorian era, that's not going to be a significant issue. And if you go to the castle archives, we've got hundreds of them because they're very common. So, you know, they're, they're, there's going to be that that trade-off between what they find and, and how that impacts. Um, but to say the watching brief is by a specialist archaeological consultant, and that's the key thing, they are experts in, in, in assessing um, the progress of a development and, and how it's impacting um, archaeological remains, if any. I, I, I don't know what more to say than that at this point. Does that, does that answer your question? Through you, Chair, I think, uh, Anna, that's correct. And I think if something significant was found and it was reported to the county ar archaeologist, uh, clearly I think there's probably the, there's the provision in that condition to actually deal with that uh, situation. But um, the Borough Council would, has the powers under the uh, listed building legislation anyway and if it considered that the uh, developer was over the mark it could always take injunctive proceedings and stop the development until um, you know, further investigations took place. So there is opportunity there. Okay, uh, Councillor Claymore. Thank you, Chair. Going back to one of the previous slides, and I can't remember which one it was, it shows, that, that's the one, um, are the masts on top, are they going to remain on there? And if so, as the health and safety of people who may take a precedence being considered? Yes, the masts are going to remain on there. And it's health and health and safety is not something that we can um, take into consideration uh, when considering masts. Just, just generally speaking, when you have an application for a mast, the, the, um, the parameters that planning can consider is like location and style and colour. And I know they're already in situ, so we're not looking at a new mast here, but in principle, it's quite limited what planning can actually think through, and health and safety is actually not one of them. Any more questions? No? Okay, let's move to the... Oh. <laughs> I, want, I want to park it, park in there. Um, is it going to be gated? So, uh, like a fob gate to stop general public going into there? The uh, parking that's um, down the west side of the access road won't be behind a gate, as it isn't at the moment. The parking that's in the youth centre car park, there will be a gate. That gate will, is managed by the county at the moment, and I think the police used to like pay a fee to, to use it sort of thing. And then the courtyard will be gated as well. I've got a question just for from Matt. So if it's not gated, I can see that there being an issue if you've got an allocated space and somebody else 
just decides actually, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna risk it and park in there. How does that There's various ways that um, they can ensure that you get to use your own space. Um, you, you could have a bollard, um, you know, that you have a key to. Um, you can put signs up saying, you know, private. private parking, don't park here. There'll be fines if you park here. And these are all things that we've discussed with the developer. Um, yeah. But it's going to be really through the management arrangements between uh, the the management company and the people who will occupy the uh, the building. Any more questions? No. Let's move to debate. Anybody want to start? Councillor Maycock. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it, it's been sat vacant for a long time. It is one of the worst buildings in the town. Um, just that pure concrete pebble dash. Um, I, I think that looks beautiful. Um, the, the only thing that it's not a question, but what what I have seen from prop, uh, properties that have had that metal sheeting on before, that that sometimes it can rust and, and run down, and that it looks absolutely horrible. So hopefully, when the conditions are coming and you look at materials and that 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 can be sorted. Uh, as you pro probably told with my questioning, my concern is with the monument that might be, might be underneath that, that part of the extension that's going to happen. And I can understand that developers do develop up and down the country, but, but not a lot of them are going to be developing in one of the most historic places in the country. Um, well, I think it is anyway. Um, and that's a concern for me and, and for the residents that, that have put me in the place to look after the heritage of the town. Um, I think moving forward, if there's such issues of historical significance like that, that the, the, the county officer should be here answering in these questions. If it's just a copied and pasted uh, condition, that then they should be here answering them questions because it, it, to me, and I'm sure across, across here, that it's, it's, it is quite significant. Um, as it's been said that it can be dealt with through the section 106 uh, and that can be passed through the chair to the members uh, on the balance of it I'd be happy to to pass this but I'm not moving that just yet Councillor Cooper Thank you Chair um, whilst I agree it does look a nice building um, and whilst I agree with the notion that we should be building on brownfield sites rather than greenbelt, um, I cannot look past the fact that it is going to have a detrimental impact on the local traffic conditions. I don't think the traffic survey has been done um, sufficiently enough. Um, I don't think we've answered the uh, issue with regards to parking either. Um, I don't. I, I cannot agree that uh, we haven't got enough spaces for the apartments. Yes, I understand it's only down the road from the train station. However, um, it's a very busy part of town. The car parks around there are always full. Um, I know that from experience. Um, and also, what I also know from experience is speaking to a hell of a lot of people uh, around that uh, around that uh, site. Um, uh, um, very recently uh, in in the in the campaign and there is a, a large concern in the town center around the amount of traffic usage over uh, the gungate junction and i think that this will only add to it and so i am um i i am more on the on the verges of, of uh, uh, pushing a motion to reject this based on a lack of car parking space available that's going to put a pressure on on local car parking spaces we're building a lot of things in the town that's going to be key to to you know people being able to use car parking spaces and we're either going to have issues with residents whereby uh, other people are going to be parking in their spaces or we're going to have issues around the town where there's going to be not enough uh, uh, car park spaces available for people who want to come into the town use the businesses use the amenities and uh, and use the things that we're we're looking forward to building <coughs> So, in fact, no, I'll move that as a motion to reject based on car parking.
looking for a seconder. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I can second that. Anybody else to debate? <coughs> Councillor Adam. I like the design and I think it's a good idea, but I can't get packed for car park in it, so I live somewhere where I don't have a car park, like, next door to me. We've got car parking spaces nearby, but not road access. So I can understand p people being foot sighted and fighting over car parks. I can understand at things, trains, people might buy a flat without a car parking space, but down the line they might have children or whatever. They're going to want a car park space. And most people have probably one or two car parts, cars, and like they're not going to have enough. It can be fighting between the residents. It can be chaos. So I agree with emotional regret. Unless you can lower the amount of flats in the place to accommodate car parks. Thank you, Councillor Thurgood. Although I really like the uh, developments, a couple of things that worry me are, uh, as Councillor Cooper said, the car parking. Um, one tends to look at personal experience and my daughter lived in a block of flats in sh the middle of Shrewsbury where free parking overnight from six till eight, but it was a case that come eight o'clock, she would have to move the car down the hill and into another part parking in front of houses which took their parking space away from them and i'm i'm we have in that area victoria road albert road we've got um albion street where i know there are major problems with people parking in in the the spaces in front of houses and i know that they haven't got a right to those car parking spaces but it can cause a lot of uh, mental pain to those people so I have to put up with that. Um, I think what was just suggested um, in up that end, um, perhaps matching the number of flats to the um, number of available spaces. Um, and, and yeah, so reluctantly, I think I'm, I've got to go against it. It, it, it. It's very slim, it's, it's on a knife edge for me, but I think at this point, I don't think it would be a bad thing to reject and, and for the developer to actually reassess the situation and come back with an alternative proposal uh, based on what we're saying. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, Councillor Claymore. I've already seconded the motion, but can I still speak? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, it wasn't just car parking for me, actually. I'd written down four things here for shortfalls. So, shortfall. so we'd got the car parks, which was a considerable shortfall. Um, the size of a couple of the apartments, which, again, was a shortfall. I, I know you ex explained that it was acceptable, but for me, it doesn't feel acceptable. Um, the outdoor space, there was a shortfall in that as well. Um, and the type of mix, and although there was a justification for that, so I still stand by that um, I'm minded to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wardrop. No, okay.
Councillor Claymore, could you just confirm your four reasons for... Right, OK. So that was the shortfall in the parking, which was considerable. I made it. Um, should have been 68 spaces and there were 40, I think. <coughs> Correct. The size of some of the apartments... I uh, can't remember the exact amount of apartments that fell short of the recommended area. Five, yeah. right, OK. Um, the outdoor space, that fell short as well of the recommended areas. And the type and mix of the, the actual apartments. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. So, Councillor Cooper, on the basis of the the, the additional um, reasons for refusal, which have been suggested by Councillor Claymore, um, would you agree to amend your motion? Absolutely. And do we have a, a seconder, the original? Okay. So just so that everyone's clear, four reasons for refusal. The first one is the shortfall in parking. Second is the shortfall in the some of the internal sort of diameters of a number of the of the apartments. I think it was four or five. Uh, there being a shortfall. The third one was a shortfall in the open space. That's external space. And the fourth one was the um, not complying with the the housing mix as directed in policy. Fifth one with traffic as well. I don't. I don't think that there's a bit of a, a proper traffic um, calculation done around there. That's for me. I, you know, it, if you can come back on that, that'd be great. Yes, I struggle with that one a little bit. <laughs> just because they have uh, submitted the required information to support the application, uh, which is part of our validation. So it, you know, it, it, it's been assessed by the experts at County Highways and they don't object. So it's quite a challenge to put in a reason for refusal uh, against a statutory consultee, I would argue. The traffic assessments, um is it something which an external contractor like, I don't know, um, or the big one, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the Brown, we, we had um, Browns Lane 1, I think, where they actually gained access onto Browns Lane, and it goes back a few years, but the, the figures that had been supplied by the contractor um, were challenged by my daughter, Michelle, who was a transport planning officer, well, not officer, but that was her job. Um, and she asked whether it had been counted that had actually done the assessment, whether it was an external company. Um, and it turned out it was the uh, external company. She ran it past her boss at the <coughs> company in Shrewsbury, and they said that the, the, the numbers that had been provided by the contractor, the, the developer, uh, were wrong and at that point I think that development was kicked out or at least access to the development was kicked out um, until they actually did a proper assessment but I'm sure probably or I hope that the county have done their own um, numbers on that I'm sure Mark can, can tell us on that yeah I was just going to say I think to clarify and having just spoken to Debbie am I right in saying that it's the county council who's assessed the site Mark and that's that's the assessment that's been taken and it's very prescribed um as mark was saying earlier on around the various different trip generation rates of different land uses and and the sort of comparison of the before and after if you like i i, I don't think a, an independent traffic assessment has been submitted so it has just been county based but mark can just absolutely clarify that point for you thank you Yeah, there's, there's various transport consultants out there. Um, 
given the size of the proposed units it doesn't require a big document like you've um, discussed like Browns Lane 1, Arkle Farm, you know Dunstall Farm it doesn't require a big traffic assessment by the national guidance that's out there it's it's without being too impolite it's too small yeah. to warrant yeah. a big traffic study mm -hmm. by the national standards that we and those consultants apply to so the assessment has been done by us using the national model of trip rates that a land use generates and we've assessed the nearby junctions etc etc as the highway authority and as the highway authority we do not believe we have an objection that we could uh, take forward okay. using the only refusal reasons at our disposal in the MPPF if that answers the question okay. I think Councillor Woodruff had her hand up yeah, I think you've answered the question now because obviously some of the things, you know, pre-COVID, I don't know what the traffic was like, the volumes and whether that was ever measured when the, the, the station was open. And obviously post-COVID, a lot of people now are working from home as well. So I'm just wondering whether that's something to, you know, whether there's any benchmarking from pre-COVID to post-COVID. The national model that all highway authorities use as a benchmark um, is a national model that is constantly updated. So there's been surveys, it's a database, is a simple way to describe <laughs> it that we all use as transport planners. Uh, the database is constantly updated and there is data in there post COVID. Um, so you are right, as an observation, there is more people working from home, there are less people traveling to and from work. Um, I myself work only three days a week in the office. I don't commute five days a week like I would have done historically. So there will be a difference. But that database does reflect to a degree, because obviously it's only a few years post-COVID. But in worst case scenario, even if it hadn't been updated, you would have a pre-COVID situation where in theory everybody would be commuting five days a week. So that's the worst case scenario if it, if it is out of date in your eyes. That's probably the better way of looking at it because it's probably a lot better post COVID because people are travelling less. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so before we go for the motion and the vote, um, Councillor Wood? Oh, okay. Okay. Can you just confirm the motions that everybody's voting on, please? Yeah, just to confirm that so the four reasons for refusal were put forwards. One was the shortfall in car parking. Second was a uh, shortfall in some of the apartments in the internal space standards. Um, third one was a shortfall in sort of external space, so open space. And the fourth one was um, compliance with mix of housing, not being quite right. Yeah. Okay, so should we go to the vote? So all in favour of the rejection? Yes. So all in favour of the rejection, so the motions. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you members. That concludes the business of this meeting and I'd like to close the meeting at 19.53 on the 5th of December. Thank you.